We were recently asked to make a video about Morgoth's Ring of Power. At first I was a little confused until I remembered about Volume 11 of the History of Middle-earth books is named Morgoth's Ring. While this title is actually a little deceiving, Morgoth did have a ring of sorts, but it's not what you may expect. I will cover this in today's video. Let's get into it. So as I said, in today's video we will take on the subject of Morgoth's Ring, a metaphorical description that Tolkien once used to describe the whole of his fallen world. Just as Sauron concentrated his power in the One Ring, Morgoth dispersed his power into the very matter of Arda, thus the whole of Middle-earth was Morgoth's Ring. This is not meant to be taken literally, the notion of Morgoth having made a ring. The idea is one of like comparison. Sauron filled the ring with his power, his essence, and will to dominate all life. Morgoth, however, strove ever to make mockery and to mar the creation of the Valar to spite Eru Iluvatar. The idea refers to the creation of evil and its persistence within the world of Middle-earth, and how the might of Morgoth was dispersed through his servants and the corrupt spirits who came to fight alongside him. Morgoth's might was so diminished through these labours of corruption and creation of evil. Examples like Glaurum, father of dragons, and Gothmog, lord of Balrogs, speak to how much of his own power went into these works, and into the persistence of evil throughout the history of Arda. This is what gives us the poetic comparison, that all of Middle-earth is Morgoth's ring. Sauron's relatively smaller power was concentrated, Morgoth's vast power was disseminated, the whole of Middle-earth was Morgoth's ring, though temporarily his attention was upon the northwest. Unless swiftly successful, war against him might end in reducing all Middle-earth to chaos, possibly even all of Arda. Melkor's constant efforts to mock and mar the works of the Valar led to a fundamentally corrupted world, one that is synonymous with the notion of a fallen world as it is understood in the Christian faith. Though we are not professional theologians, we know that Tolkien was influenced by the ideas of original sin, that humanity is fallen, that is to say we do not live in the world as it was originally intended, and the temptations of Satan and the desires of men have brought low what would have been otherwise a better world. The insight we have into Tolkien's creative process portray a man who is deeply considerate of the underlying theological implications of his work, and a man who is deeply aware of eliminating any and all inconsistencies within it, if possible. The Forging of the Silmarillion, it must be said, was a work that began long before The Hobbit, and was a work that underwent so much concentrated effort, starts and stops, that we must look at it as Tolkien's ring, the great labour of his life, and every bit as precious and brilliant a shining light as the great jewels of Feanor. Throughout the volume we learn of the numerous changes and attempts at changing the legendarium Tolkien made in the years between finishing the Two Towers and starting work on The Return of the King. What he wrote at that time we would come to know as the downfall of Numenor, but at the same time he was writing versions of his myth in which the world was never round. Which seems to give us some insight at the real struggles of an author in their twilight years, feeling the press of time against him and understanding the depth of the rewrites necessary to bring the Silmarillion's more fantastical and less realistic ideas into line with the tone of the Lord of the Rings. Some of the great ideas Tolkien would abandon in his earlier sketches, which include some of the most beautiful ideas we have from the Legendarium, that might have been abandoned had Tolkien ever achieved his goals in life. One of the reasons he could never quite make it work was that the early mythology was more whimsical and less serious than it would come to be, and Malko was more of a Loki figure than a satanic one. One example is that during the lighting of the great lamps, Malko puts them on sticks of ice so that when they are lit, the ice melts and the world is again in darkness. He was the brother of Manwe, the trickster god, but not an explicit evil as he would evolve into in later editions. The volume also presents us with a completed text, the Athrobeth, the conversation between the mortal woman Andreth and Finrod Felagund on the differences between their people is fascinating. They discuss their differences, the difference of their lives and most importantly, the different fate which awaited humanity, the potential for a second music and the possibility that the fear of death is a remnant of Morgoth, part of his ring so to speak. Andreth suggests that humanity was originally meant to live forever, but at some point this possibility was denied to us, which again reflects Tolkien's personal faith, the fall of man and our expulsion from Eden. Finrod believes that the gift of men and the gift of elves has always been different, and that one breeding envy on the other is the shadow of Morgoth playing on the human fear of the unknown. 
The History of Middle-earth book series allows us a look behind the curtain, a glimpse of the creative process behind the beloved stories we have all come to cherish. We learn what Tolkien thought of his work, how his ideas changed over time, and what we lost in the original publication of The Silmarillion. Some ideas were altered and others removed entirely, such as the exclusion of the children of the Valar, the Valarindri, or the two lamps which hung on either end of the world. We get a good look at where Tolkien's legendarium remained shortly after he finished working on the Two Towers and before he started The Return of the King. The moment of marriage between his older mythology and later stories, like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, came early on, in The Fellowship of the Ring. It's not a major story point perhaps, and it takes place when Aragorn, still under the guise of Strider, has encamped with the four hobbits on Weathertop, with Ringwraiths approaching unseen. Strider says, I will tell you the tale of Tenuviel, for it is a long tale of which the end is not known, and there are none now except Elrond, that remember it aright as it was told of old. It is a fair tale, though it is said, as are all the tales of Middle-earth, and yet it may lift up your hearts. This is more than just a hint at Strider's true identity. It is a moment where Tolkien's earlier sketch mythology became the mythic history of Middle-earth. What we are presented with in Morgoth's Ring, as volume 10 of the history of Middle-earth, is meant as an explanation, a glimpse at where the good professor was in his work and what remained to him. He would spend his remaining years trying to finish the Silmarillion in a way that would be consistent with the Lord of the Rings in all instances, but he was caught up with what his son Christopher called the underlying metaphysical and theological postulates which underpinned his mythology. In Tolkien's mind, the free-flowing myth of decades prior was no longer mature enough, nor realistic enough to pass for a true history for his created world. It may be that he came to perceive from such experimental writing as this text that the old structure was too comprehensive, too interlocked in its parts, indeed in its roots too deep, to withstand such a devastating surgery. In conclusion, the ring being referred to in the title is metaphorical, and it means to be a comparison to the way Sauron forged the ring by putting all his evil and his will inside it, to corrupt those who used and those who engaged in it. There was no actual ring. The diminishment of Morgoth's power by the time he dueled with Fingolfin had seen him pass from what was once nearly a god to being able to be wounded by an Alderan elf. That is how greatly the world of Arda was marred and imbued by the dreadful will and purpose of Morgoth, making all of Arda Morgoth's ring. Melkor, in accomplishing his desire to mock the creation of Eru and the other Valar, had his powers so dispersed that the fields of Arda, each dark place and deep dungeon, all contained the touch of evil left by Morgoth in his continuous efforts to ruin and mock creation, the gods and Eru himself. Time has come, as always, to thank all of our patrons and channel members. We are moving along nicely at the moment with our short film, so again, if you are a patron or a channel member, you will get lots of behind-the-scenes content coming your way very soon. That's it for me today, my friends. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.